Arts Fair. It's been a long but very fulfilling uh, four days, uh, three days of, four days actually, of, of presentations and workshops. And I hope you've all been able to enjoy yourselves and learn something new. Um, before I introduce our keynote speaker, I'd just like to um, give you a little um, uh, idea of what's coming next. So we will have our keynote from 3.30 to 4.15, and then we will have a wrap-up session with the organizers. So just some housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, we will use the Q&A for questions. So please don't put your questions in the chat, put them in the Q&A um, feature, but uh, we, we encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat box. Or, um, if you want to ask a question live with your voice, just raise your hand and we will unmute you. And again, use the webinar chat for um, messages or um, introducing yourself. And a reminder, the event is being recorded. Um, all participants' microphones are muted. Um, and all the presentations from the Open Science Fair will be posted on Zenodo um, or, and will be, uh, the videos will be on the OS Fair YouTube channel. And we strongly encourage you to tweet um, your comments about the OS Fair using this hashtag. And here is the Twitter handle. And a reminder um, that we expect all attendees to adhere to the code of conduct of the conference. So without further ado, um, first of all, I'm Kathleen Shearer. I'm the executive director of CORE. And I'm very pleased to introduce our final keynote of the Open Science Fair, um, uh, Matt Byes, who's the executive director of DataSight. And Matt will be talking about the whys of open science, unpacking the core elements of community change and exploring what convergence looks like in the practice of open science. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the stage over to Matt. Great, thanks very much, Kathleen. Um, I think I need, oh, there we go. I've got access to share my screen. Uh, just to double check that you uh, can you see my screen? Looks good, Matt. Perfect. I've done that twice this week already. Started presenting and forgot to <laughs> turn on my screen sharing. It's great to um, be here and um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you to the organizers for pulling together such a great event. Um, really, this is something that is true, true to what we do at DataSite. Uh, we really love engaging with others, talking about technology, talking about engagement, um, building sustainable infrastructure um, within the community. And so um, I hope that some of what I share today is thought provoking, um, share some ideas, but also um, create some energy in the community. And as we all work together, um, helps us move forward. Um, first and foremost, as any proud father would, I'm a new father or um, my second son was born last week so uh, I, I apologize that I was possibly not in in all of the sessions I have tried to um, check in with some of the recordings and join as many as possible and so I, I do apologize to other speakers if if there is some overlap in the session um, but um, I also thought thought I'd I'd share that news um, as any proud father would I think so without further ado, uh, let me jump right in. Uh, so um, I like this image. I thought it was interesting. Um, this is sort of pre the digital age and pre um, the world as we know it today. And so sitting on the couch in the evening, oh, well, you know, I thought of something and I'd like to know more about this. Um, and well, that's a shame. You, you're probably going to have to wait until tomorrow to go to the library or or go ask an expert or um, send a telegram if we go a bit further back. And, you know, the, these are sort of things that um, were in the past and we really live in an age now where it's an exciting time for us and there's a lot of potential and a lot that can be done 
and within the realm of open science, there's a lot of opportunity um, for us to, to advance as, as society. Some interesting um, figures that I thought would be relevant that um, present um, bo both, um, I guess, a challenge, but also an opportunity for us as, as a global community. And the one is that 80% of the countries um, in the world spend less than 1% of their GDP on research. And so we know that there's obvious reasons that many countries can't afford to spend more than 1% of their GDP on, on um, research and development. Um, but we also um, know that we as the open science community have a very, very important role to play here and a critical um, uh, time for us in the digital age to be able to support communities um, around access to information and reuse of research. We also know that 93% of the global research expenditure is accounted for by uh, the G20 countries. And so um, again, an opportunity exists. So let's start with some context. Uh, Datasight, um, our vision at Datasight is to connect research identifying knowledge. And so um, in doing this, we are looking to bring together disparate pieces of research entities across the research life cycle. And so recognizing that a research article is not the entirety of a research study, that there are many different pieces, many different contributions to the research life cycle. And if we look at you know, knowledge transfer and sort of indigenous knowledge and how that's used in the realm of science, there's really important pieces in, across that research life cycle. And so we really try and make sure that we can bring this and surface this in, in discoverability tools um, across the global um, infrastructure. Um, as Kathleen mentioned, I'm gonna talk a bit about the why in open science, why, why open science is important. I think this is not anything that's new to any of us, but um, really emphasizing a key point, some key points that I, I would like to share unpacking some of the elements about how we go about community change and looking at well, what does it look like when we have convergence on technology and engagement and how do we look at this from a sustainable infrastructure perspective. Uh, jumping into the technology piece um, and, and I'll flesh these out a bit in a moment, but technology, we can talk about building things, we can talk about APIs, we can talk about the magic that makes it happen. Um, I think um, our development team always always um, um, are a bit interested when I say, oh, just build the magic. And then, you know, it's, there's a lot of effort and, and work that goes into this, but it's not just about technology. Um, we also need to recognize that our focus and efforts across domains, across disciplines, across borders will vary and will continue to vary. Um, but we do see a common goal in creating, enhancing technology to make open science easy, possible and normative and I'll talk a bit about that in a moment. Engagement is a really key piece. When we talk about engagement, we need to focus on people. And um, without people, without communities, um, we are not going to be in a position as a community to really affect um, long-term change, sustainable change that we can uphold as a community and that really um, changes the way things are being done. And so this is really important to not forget the engagement piece um, when we look at this. Sustainable infrastructure. Um, sustainable infrastructure, and I saw some of this come out in the first session and some of the panels talking about, well, when we invest in infrastructure, how do we make sure that it, we do have the insurance that we putting money, effort, resources into building tools and infrastructure what, what assurance do we have? And so we need to look at what is the governance around the infrastructure? What services are provided as part of the infrastructure? Uh, the insurance that comes along with this. So in terms of creating open data files, open licenses is really important. And then also not to be overlooked the long-term sustainability of infrastructure in that we wanna make sure that these are not um, siloed or uh, one-off um, efforts to build a tool or build um, a siloed approach um, that isn't sustainable on an ongoing basis. And bringing this together, we then want to look at, well, what is the pyramid for change and how do we look for, for um, real community consensus and convergence around these issues? Uh, I've included a pyramid here and 
this is from Brian at uh, the Center for Open Science. This was, I, I think, a couple of years back that Brian had put out a blog post about making change. And really what I want to uh, focus on here today is how do we make it possible and how do we make it easy um, and, and talking a bit about that. So why open science? Um, the reason many of us get out of bed each morning, I know that this is something that is true to a lot of us here on the call. Um, I guess I'm somewhat preaching to the converted here that we all believe very strongly in this. We do this in our day-to-day -day lives, um, but this is not an individual effort and it's an effort that involves more people than are, than are here today. I wanted to start with a brief um, example of um, something that I thought was an effort that was interesting. Um, and this was the World Bank Open Data Platform and um, really where this came from and some of the change, if you, you go look at the, the um, story behind this was that the World Bank has a, a core value that they want to eradicate poverty. And so they really considered the opportunity cost of not adopting open access or what was the detriment, what, what happens to society if they weren't going to uh, adopt open access. And so recognizing that there were these key benefits for society and that knowledge is power, this led to a significant shift in the way they operated and this was shifting from a publishing operation um, where there was sales of products and, and resources to the complete opposite, where they were going to give away everything, make it accessible because of that fundamental value that they had as, as an organization. Um, and this was a fundamental change. And, and we need to see a lot of this in, in different areas of the community around the world um, to continue to bring a network of change about. Uh, the reach is broad and the World Bank is a known entity, it is global. And so the more um, examples like this that we have, the more um, organizations that are taking um, this more seriously, the better. And it's not just about access, it's also about use, it's about reuse and this leading to the benefits for society. As I mentioned, open science, and we all know, is a collective movement. It has the promise to make science more efficient, reliable, and responsive, responsive to societal changes. Um, we want to focus on bringing together these disparate parts of the research lifecycle to support re reproducibility and bring rigor to the scholarly record. Um, our practices in the open science community um, really include activities around open access, availability and reproducibility of research results, making it easier to communicate knowledge um, across um, the globe and advances and make advances in science. The interpretation and the application of open science varies across disciplines, um, domains and borders. And we always need to be cognizant of this. I mentioned it earlier, and it's something that we need to be cognizant of. It's not a revolution. And so um, that's something that um, I think we need to be clear about that. Open science is, is really a continuation. Uh, it's not a revolution. We're not trying to completely change everything. We are really uh, building on practices that began in the 17th century with the advent of the academic journal. And we are um, looking at a great opportunity with the digital age and um, the technology that we have around us to actually um, further um, the, the reach and dissemination of, of knowledge. We do need to learn to see things from different perspectives. So um, even within open science, there's different schools of thoughts. There's a, a democratic thought that looks more around, okay, this is a, more about access to knowledge. There's um, an infrastructure school that um, really is around making tools and services available to support the research process. I, I would say that data sites and, and myself may be more so um, see this as a very important element, but also we have to recognize these other schools. Um, public, um, so accessibility to the research process and, and uh, rigor to the scholarly record. Um, these schools around measurement, so focusing on the scientometrics of, of science, 
And then there's also the more pragmatic school of thought around making knowledge creation and dissemination more efficient. Um, and, and this is not to say that there is any right or wrong school of thought and, and that we don't have to sit within any particular school of thought, but recognize that there's differing thoughts and ideas around open science and um, how we move forward. Some of the fundamentals that I think are key here is that we want to foster innovation and we want to support knowledge transfer. And so in a nutshell, open science has this potential and, and I say has this potential too, because I, I think we already have made significant advances in the community, but there's a lot more work that we can, can do. Um, but these um, to reduce delays in the reuse of research outputs, bring rigor um, through the reproducibility um, and also increase our path to innovation through this open and broad dissemination of research. In talking about open science, uh, I think we need to be a little bit careful about buzzwords. Uh, we definitely do this a lot. I, I do this a lot personally. And, you know use these acronyms and different buzzwords um, but i think we need to be careful when we use these because it sometimes clouds what we're actually trying to do and what we're trying to achieve and so um you know i use one persistent identifiers and well what what is the use case for persistent identifiers and pits and it's not just about the persistent identifier it's about the metadata the services and the tools that exist around this machine actionable fair infrastructure these are all things that we often in conversations use and throw around as um, catchy phrases or buzzwords, but um, sometimes without context and, and I guess a practical element of what we specifically mean and concrete tangible activities, we um, lose some of the momentum and some of the um, energy that we, we um, want to create in the community. Looking at the driving force, um, behind open science is that we have this opportunity to really affect change due to uh, globalization and advances in ICT in this digital age. And um, we can unlock the potential of science and technology in order to address these societal challenges. And I think that's really powerful. Um, I often talk to my family and extended family about what we do each day. And we as a community do help and support making society a better place in our daily jobs, every little piece that we do um, does support this. And so um, our future is positive if we get open science right. And so under the umbrella of technology, um, where do we want to focus? We want to focus on making it possible. So using technology to build, enable, and make technology available. We want to build it that it's community and purpose built um, to make it possible. So we, we really engaging, sitting down, working through the workflows. And there's many different open science efforts, projects, large scale infrastructure projects where um, certain stakeholders will come together, but we forget the core element of um, bringing in actual researchers, the end users that will, will be using this, the uh, um, uh, citizen science stakeholders, et cetera. And so it's really important to make a community and purpose built. Um, Research stakeholders don't want complex solutions. And so we need to think carefully from our past and learn from our past mistakes that we're not building anything that's too complex um, for the community. So moving into um, community change, um, I wanted to unpack this a bit and starting off with um, also again, something that I, I think is really interesting, and, and this is really focusing around communities of practice. And I use an example, and I apologize um, for the um, mispronunciation here. And I also notice a typo on the page. <laughs> I apologize for that as well. Um, but um, the historic villages of Shirakawa Go and Gokoyama uh, are two. Um, villages in uh, Japan, which are UNESCO World Heritage Sites. And, and these uh, villages have unique houses with a very special design. But what is interesting about these communities is annually the community comes together and everyone has a special role. Everyone has a certain role that they do in the community. So they have um, those that are specialists on working on the roofs, those that are specialists on doing 
the timber work. And so they all come together with their unique roles um, and their practice and work together as this community. And this is really, for me, a great example of a community of practice that we need to recognize that we all have our different roles. And so if we go back to the schools of thought that I was talking about in open science is that we can work together across those different schools of thoughts and different focuses, um, but it does require that um, collective effort. The concept of change and so um, working on change is really important as we know that we need to identify who, how and what. Um, this won't be a centralized movement. This is not something that we will have complete convergence and agreement on everything that needs to happen in the community but rather a collective of collective movements. And so trying to focus on that is that, what can we do in our, in our little uh, collective movement or uh, group or uh, community to affect change? And how do we link that up to other changes that are happening out there in the community? Shifting from this interest to practice, and so we, we often talk about communities of interest, that we, we have a community, we have a domain in open science, um, but then it's that practice and what are those actual tangible activities that we're going to work on together. And so we need to find these synergies, thinking about starting to scale these practices um, on a global scale, this can't be a local, um, if we look at the theme of, of the event this year, that it is a global collective effort we need to focus on making it easy. Um, we need to um, make sure that those that are um, using um, the different tools, um, engaging in training efforts, um, working in different workflows that we're setting up in open science, and um, that it is simple and easy. Um, this will lead to community-driven driven approaches. And if we follow these community-driven approaches, it's more likely that we'll be able to foster this open collaboration and adoption will be more natural. The research life cycle, I, I touched on this briefly earlier, that we faced with the challenge that current research articles only provide a fraction of the information required to fully evaluate a research study. And I wanna be careful here that I, I'm not trying to detract from the research, research um, article and, and saying that these are substandard they're not at all. And, and there is um, a lot of value in, in the peer review process and, and articles and, and research that is published. But we also want to, alongside this, recognize the entirety of the research study and focusing on all of these different elements that come together. And this includes you know, the data management plans, it includes the research data, the protocols, the methods, the the data, the instruments that were used, the software that was used, and bringing this together to, to foster that reproducibility and reuse of, of research. And so uh, within um, community change here and focusing around engagement, um, it's important that we make this easy. And so we won't bring about this change without involving people and to a large degree, this is not a fundamental technical challenge. Um, I, I also do, do know that um, some technical teams and um, experts in our field um, get a bit irritated with me when I make some of these comments because it almost um, downplays, oh, we can just build anything. Um, but, you know, with the right resources, with the right time, um, we can build technology. Um, but it's important that we're involving the people because we, if we don't involve people and communities in building this technology, um, that's when we, we fall short of, of um, scaled adoption on a global level. Practice includes workflows, it includes tools, it includes communication, it includes policy, it includes recognition. This is complex, it's not simple, um, but together we can affect more change and, and going back to what is our practice, what is our role in the community is really important. Um, engagement will foster this evolution and make it easy. Looking at convergence, um, what does this look like? And this is somewhat, I, I guess, a bit of Matt's thoughts, what, what convergence looks like. And I'm sure everyone here today has some different ideas and thoughts about what this means. 
Um, but really, um, where I see this is that um, convergence is when we start to see open science becoming normative. Um, and for me, a strong indicator is when we start talking about science again, when, when we don't have to talk about open science, um, that we are just talking about the practice of science. Um, I, you know, maybe it's unrealistic to, to think this, but I do think that if, if we, it becomes normative that open science is, science is open, um, that's really when we know that we are reaching an, a point, a, a tipping point that we really have um, seen things becoming normative. So through enabling and building technology, um, working with people and communities, we will start to affect this collective change. This technology and again in, and engagement brings across uh, brings across different things in, in um, looking at this convergence that we bring efficiency, so we bring better access to the disparate pieces of the research life cycle. We bring quality and integrity, so uh, supporting reproducibility and accessibility. We we improve the integrity of research. There's economic benefits in that we support and drive innovation with broad dissemination of knowledge. If we go back to some of the figures that I used at the beginning, that well, what about communities that um, don't have the financial resources or countries that don't have the financial resources to invest heavily in research? How does open science support and, and drive uh, innovation in those regions? Innovation and knowledge transfer, enhancing the reuse and promoting further innovation, so reusing information that exists. Providing recognition and attribution, and this is really important, so attribution to all involved in the research lifecycle. Just recently I was um, having discussions with um, a group that's looking at Indigenous knowledge rights, and it's a really important concept around how do we provide attribution to Indigenous knowledge. Um, that for a long time ha hasn't been um, appropriately attributed um, and open science can really support this. And then we have these societal benefits in bringing innovations to the daily lives of people around the world. Mm -hmm. So this is all great. What is holding us back? Um, for me, it's a lack of convergence and um, maybe that's a given. Um, but I do think that it's really important that um, we, we are not trying to build one, one solution. We're trying to understand the different perspectives and finding a path forward together. Sustainability here is key that we often in our community will uh, develop and launch projects that build um, very interesting tools, services, or launch new training programs or implement new policy. But how do we ensure that that is sustainable over time? Um, in, in perpetuity, that we, we are really affecting that long-term change. That is a really important aspect of everything that we do. And then the complexity that we need to be careful about um, building complex solutions. Um, we need to build from the ground up that we are finding simple work, workflows through this engagement with the primary stakeholders. And really at a fundamental level, focus on making it easy and making it possible. And I think if we get those two right, uh, making it easy and making it possible, we really then, the, the top of that pyramid that I, that I shared um, really starts to come together when we can start making it normative, start making it required. This is timely. I think um, we, we have, um, had discussions around, uh, we, we have been having discussions for a long time around open science. It's, as I said, it's not new, it's not a revolution. Um, but what we have seen um, globally from COVID-19 is that open data and research assets are, are important um, and the benefits that that brings. And this also presents a opportunity for us as a community to ride this wave to use this broader awareness in society about the impact of what research and innovation has and, and openness and open science more broadly and ride that wave and make use of that um, to, to bring together um, different stakeholders. Change is going to start um, with us, but it can't be achieved alone. And so it's not just isolated groups. Um, I always like to say, think about why you love your job. And so 
for me, this is something that um, you know I talk to my family about what I do each day and why I love this. And really, it is you know the the why of open science and, and the benefits that we we stand to bring to society at large um, in doing our daily practice. And um, I know it's maybe a bit uh, blue skies and you know thinking, well, oh, you know, we we solve the world problem world's problems. And I think there's a lot of a lot of things that the world needs to solve, but we do certainly play a very important role um, in, in society today. We should inspire others about this impact. And so we should share and talk to others and bring people into our community, get them involved. Um, seeking to work together is really important. Um, we um, often build these silos um, we see differing opinions as something that we can't work with. And so how do we enable these crosswalks? crosswalks? I think um, with the European Open Science Cloud, this has been really good to see a lot of efforts and some of the cores focusing on crosswalks between different tools and infrastructures, um, different um, training programs, et cetera. Thinking about long-term sustainability and insurance. So ensuring that this investment in resources, effort, um, and time is um, long-term. And remember that we have a common mission. And so with my uh, final uh, call to action, um, share how you, you are making open science possible and um, let us know how you are making open science easy. And so it would be great if everyone here today as part of this community um, that, that we work within and sharing about this impact. Um, if we can um, maybe today share with, with the broader community um, what we are doing, so I'm sure all of us are working on something at the moment and share how this is making open science possible and making it easy. And also let the community know how you can collaborate and work with, with you. Um, and yeah, that's um, all I had. I'm, I think, one minute short of um, 30 minutes. Um, I didn't want it to be um, death by PowerPoint, I guess. Um, hopefully it was interesting. Um, I'm really interested to hear anyone's thoughts or questions or comments. Um, we love talking to others in the community. And again, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to present. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, lots of interesting things to think about there. Uh, but I just wanted to say, first of all, you're looking surprisingly awake for a, a new father. So congratulations. <laughs> yeah, it's been a, a lot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, well, I, I'm going to use the, the privilege of the moderator um, to perhaps ask the first question. And I welcome audience members, please, to put your questions in the Q&A. Um, this is something I've been thinking about a lot, and I'd be really interested in, in your thoughts about this. And it's really about how to build like global open science infrastructure, um, you know, that kind of t benefits from cost efficiencies around sharing uh, shared infrastructure that seems to be more visible to researchers. Yet, on the other hand, you know, supporting local needs, supporting different languages, different research priorities, different domains. And so where, how can we strike that balance where we're support, supporting diversity, equity and inclusion, but we're also, you know, developing non-siloed kind of infrastructure that can be useful for, for, for everyone. Yeah, it's a really important one. And I think it's, there's no easy way forward. I, I think for me, what I would say is that bringing in that engagement, so if you have the opportunity to engage and work with as many communities as, as possible, that's great. But I look at data site, one of our core values is inclusivity. And we have uh, members, organizational members across 48 countries, but it's not realistic for us to really, uh, you know, as much as we do try and engage and make sure that we, we represent the interests and the workflows and the use cases in all 48 countries, it's not always feasible and possible. And then, so I think with that in mind, as you build infrastructure that 
Um, you need to make sure that you're also making it openly available, that it's an open license can be reused. So if you're building technology, it should be freely available. The data should, you should not be looking to commercialize any data or protect the data. The data should be open and your code and software should be open. And that then creates the opportunity for, for two things. One, that communities can adapt to their uh, local workflows in, in a certain country or region, and they can build on top of that and um, those services and technology. But also, if there's some real specific needs that they would like to look at, they could also fork that technology and infrastructure and plug into the global infrastructure. And so I think trying to strike that balance is kind of how I would look at it, is that there's this effort to make this global infrastructure available, but building either on top of it or forking it for specific needs would make sense to me. And um, that we try then break down, at least then it's not a complete siloed approach that we we ending up in 20 years time. Okay, how do we address this? Because we've got these different um, infrastructures that don't quite align. Yeah, and I think your point about collaboration is also important. The more we collaborate, maybe maintaining our own um, jurisdictional independence and so on, but collaborating, you know, sort of builds in um, interoperability and alignment. Absolutely. Looking for any other questions? Um, there's nothing in the Q&A right now, so then I'll move on to my second question, <laughs> which is... Um, Something that I've heard, and this is really about um, minting DOIs, you know, very much the, the, the core business of, of data site. And I guess one of the, the barriers for developing countries is the cost of, of DOIs. And I'm wondering if you, you've discussed that in the context of data site and if you have any thoughts about how we can address that barrier. Yeah, a really important one. And so we, we fundamentally believe that as an individual, as a researcher, you shouldn't have to ever pay um, to have a DOI. And so we also work with a number of partners that um, can support that and open platforms. Um, but I don't think that fully addresses everything. And so there's still more work to be done. Um, we um, have looked and we implemented a new model um, just last year at data uh, which is a consortium model we have 44 of these regional or national consortia which really allows for a key uh, consortium lead to support small organizations and communities um, i was really excited we launched a new um, consortium in malawi uh, based out of malawi um, and so that's just one example of where we're trying to make sure that we support this um, there is a cost recovery element um, in that we need to recognize that infrastructure does cost um, and we need to make sure that also we're protecting that long-term investment so that we don't want everyone to invest and build technology around infrastructure and for in 10 years time that ought to be disappear and then i heard this in the first session is that well if we invest in this what is our assurance that we do have this and that doesn't mean that developing regions um, should have to pay. And so I think there's more that can be done. I think there's more that can be done at a broader, more sort of um, governmental level. You know, if we look at the spread of um, research and development investments um, across the G20 countries, well, how do we support the other countries and make open science possible? Um, I do think that if we focus there to make sure that that sustains the infrastructure, that the other regions can then plug in and make use of the infrastructure without having to pay, then we've done a lot in the community. Um, so we don't have the answer completely. We are trying to address it from a data side perspective. Um, but I also, we will always um, talk to, and, and we often have inquiries from organizations that say we want to register five DOIs and we would rather them work with a um, organization that already works with data site then try have another member or another organization because we, the goal here is that we make sure that we support the means to create fine site research um, and make it openly available and so if we're creating financial barriers to that then we're not doing our role in the community in the open science community so I hope, sorry, that was a bit of a roundabout answer, but um, a few points there and, and yeah, not fully solved, but lots to still be done there. Yeah, I, I think you're right. There's no, there's no 
um, good answer for that, but it's something that we will continue to have to grapple with, yeah. uh, I think. Um, so there's a couple of um, a comments, uh, one comment and a couple of questions in the Q&A, and I'll just read them out. Okay. So Elena says, just a comment. Thank you for this inspiring talk. You touched all the critical points. Thank you, Elena. And Julia says, can you share some examples of community of practices, any successful stories? Yeah, I think, um, let me share one where, um, so a very brief one, and, and I actually do need to get this up onto the RDA website at some point, um, but um, looking up a system identification for instruments. And so there was, there really was a lot of interest around identifying instruments in the community um, as part of this research life cycle. So the RDA working group really brought together that interest and sought to build out the community um, interest and identifying tangible um, practical things to take that forwards from interest into practice. And that's where we then took that on from a data site perspective, working with um, EPIC in Europe, um, so GWDG um, that ran EPIC and um, also EUDAP to launch APIDs for instruments pilot service. And so this for me was a very small example of where we looked at a community of practice that um, we looked at that community that developed those specific roles and things that can be done. And one of those roles was implementing some schema mappings and a service or tool to create a registry. And that's where we went and built that out um, and embedded that into the broader persistent identify graph and, and reuse. Um, there's many different uses and I'm obviously talking from an infrastructure tooling perspective. I think there's many examples in training and um, communication communities of practice as well. And, and maybe just, sorry, I, and I'm talking a lot here, but a community of practice um, has the core elements of that. You have a community, you have a domain, so a common domain, and you have a practice. And so I think it's important identifying what is that practice that you're going about as a community of practice. And again, um, identifying your specific role in that community. Thanks, Matt. Um, there is another question here, a very challenging one. Um, openness can be seen as a privilege that many can't afford because withholding of commercial data can be a way of developing local resources. Look at developing countries' COVID data. How do we ensure that open doesn't turn into a tool for the haves to exploit the have-nots? Yeah, really, really important. And, and I think, I, I don't think I have the, the, the answer to that, uh, to be honest, but I think this is something I know when, when I was previously at ORCID and doing a lot of work in, in Africa, um, running, you know, various researcher workshops is that there's often data that's produced that there's no attribution. And, and so I think in making things open, it's important that we do have the attribution, that the rights information is attached to that and that we, um, from a training perspective in the open science community are really, um, um, I guess, strong about what attribution um, what we should be doing in terms of attribution practices. This also goes for, I've, I've been speaking a lot with Indigenous knowledge um, communities and Indigenous knowledge rights, because many times we have archives and knowledge that is used and that the correct attribution is not provided. And so I think this comes into the practice and the training and work that we're doing with the community. Um, it will take time. And um, I think if we make it easy and possible, to do that attribution, making it normative and making it required comes on from that. So again, making it easy and making it possible um, for me, again, are, are the core pieces to, to move that forwards. Thanks, Matt. Thanks so much. And, and on not that note, I think um, we've come to the end of the closing keynote. Matt, thank you so much again for for joining us and giving us a lot to think about as we close, as we end the Open Science Fair. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, great to see so many familiar faces and reach out if you want to have more conversations and we hope to continue to work with you all. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah, and hope to see you soon in person. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with your son. Thank you. 
Okay, let me just get my slides up. So here we are, we're at the end of the uh, very successful, very rich open science fair. Um, I'd like to start off by just saying thank you to the organizers or the organizations that participated in organizing the open science fair. You can see them listed here. Open Air, which was the lead organization, CORE, SPARK, La Referencia, Operas, Force 11, E. Eiffel, Lieber, and, and Spark Europe. And um, before I go on to thank the others, um, we've decided to end the, this session um, with a comment from each of the organi or organizers, and I've asked them to respond to this question. In your opinion, what is the one development that would have the biggest impact on advancing open science or open scholarship? Um, so who shall I turn to first? Why don't we start with Irina from EIFO? Thanks a lot, Kathleen. Um, and um, that's, that's not really an easy task to say it in one word, but I would say fostering bibliodiversity. And that's a call that we made a year ago in CORE. And uh, I think if we foster diversity of uh, scholarly outputs, diversity of approaches to research assessment, diversity in infrastructures, uh, that would create a path to more equitable uh, and more fair open science. Um, and um, on the global level, we already have UNESCO open science recommendations that could be an umbrella instrument to unite those diverse local approaches to local to open science. Thank you, Irina. Let's see how much overlap there is in what people say as well. So um, let me ask uh, next, uh, Elena Giglia from Operas. Yeah, I, I I really don't know when you when you ask uh, this question. I I mean, after COVID, what else do we need to to see the benefit of open science? I I really don't know. So I I would be tempted to say um, new research evaluation criteria. Because of course, uh, research evaluation is key, but I fear it also works as an excuse uh, to wait somehow uh, open science happening uh, somewhere. So my, my message would be, uh, let's start doing what you can do now. And we, we saw during this amazing uh, open science fair that there is a, a lot, a lot of tools uh, out there uh, they are available and they make it easy, uh, as Matt was saying, uh, or to, to, to quote the, the Turing way and, and Rachel uh, Ainsworth, it's too easy not to do it. So I, I would say that, and, and also my, my take home message from, from this open science fair is that you are not alone. So really the importance of, of the community. And, and I saw a growing community uh, out there uh, to support you and to share, to, to co-create, to collaborate. I, I was astonished to, to listen to Malvika Sharam's talk on the richness of initiative and players. So it, it's a matter of convergence and creating synergies in my opinion. Thank you very much, Elena. Um, how about Lautaro from La Referencia? I, well, it's hard to choose one development, but I, if I think in a positive impact in advancing open science, I will prioritize, prioritize uh, to implement changes in research assessment. Uh, mainly because we need to create genuine incentives to researchers and communities. We need to reinforce the open science practices in our research ecosystem, not only for the results and data sharing, but especially for the data reuse. We need to create mechanisms to onboard the research data reuse because it's a way not only to increase the collaboration, it's always it's also a way 
for smart use of the public funds. Uh, so, uh, in, in, in the other hand, uh, international collaboration is, is great. What, what we are doing here is great, but it's not always easy. It's, it's in part because the language and the cultural differences. But the, and at the end of the day, even if I think better in what Elena said, uh, building a diverse uh, global open science community is the best possible way to have a true impact in the long term. Uh, so thank you very much for all the organizers and participants for, for helping us to give another big step in the building of, of our global uh, uh, open science community. Thank you. Thanks, Lotaro. Um, so let me turn it over to Violetta. Hi, thank you all. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, I actually did not uh, need to think a long, long and hard about the one development uh, that would have the biggest impact on advancing open science. As a librarian, I believe that moving away from academia's dependencies on subscriptions to expensive payroll journals that actually negotiate their impact factors and moving away from metrics that rule the academia right now are the best things we can do to advance open science. These two are interconnected and librarians can help in various ways. In, if the past 18 months have not shown something that is, that is one thing, open science benefits all. Actually, to be completely frank, uh, right now benefits only the global north because the global south is still struggling to see the positive effects of the rapid vaccine development and uh, the benefits seen on the, in the global north are very visible and very visible very fast we don't have to wait for years for the world to see our research but the academia's dependencies on metrics is what is dragging our arrival in the 21st century and the equitable access to knowledge for all. Fundamental issue here is evaluation and promotion. Practices in the assessment of researchers and scholarly research. And until the ways these are looked at and changed the, and academia's dependencies on metrics, on prestige journals is cut off, we are not going to see the much needed change. We should all work hard to change our practice in the assessment of researchers and scholarly research is done and align ourselves with the principles of DORA. And I would like to conclude with, uh, by citing the United Cognit uh, Unintended Cognitive and Systems Biases identified by DORA and note that judgment and decision-making biases that impact how we weigh options and make choices have been shown to result in uh, inequitable review, promotion, and hiring practices. While recognizing these biases at the personal level is important, creating new structural and institutional conditions to reduce bias can be even more valuable. Then at that point, we can move forward with recognizing the importance of uh, publishing and uh, engaging in open science. Thank you. Thank you so much, Violetta. Um, so I'd like to ask Astrid from Lieber to go next. Looks like Astrid is having some issues. So maybe in a, okay. in a minute. Okay. <laughs> well, I was leaving um, Natalia for the last, but pl Natalia, please, please go ahead. Uh, hi. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, I, I'm not sure I wanted to be last because everyone has said <laughs> things. So let me, let me, let me. Can, can I say two, two, two things? You know, just not one thing. I will be. But yeah. I will since be very... we're missing our our Spark colleagues, you can say two things. Okay. Good. Okay. <laughs> so I think you know I, I I'm going to repeat what what the others actually repeated. So I will repeat what uh, Elena re said. It's about the tooling. You know. We, we have been talking about incentives. We have been talking about career assessments for years. You know, it's, it's either nothing is happening or it's too little, too late perhaps. 
Uh, but if researchers, you know, if we if we change our thinking and say, okay, you know, what is the tooling? And the libraries are very uh, keen to that. What is it that they want? I mean, you know, everyone is using Google, for example. Everyone is using all of these things that, you know, every day. How can we make, you know, small and smart services for the for the for the researchers to use? Because that's is is you know when when these are the incentives, not the incentives for the careers, but the incentives to make their life easier. Okay, I think you know this is this is one point, and I really like you know that especially from the demos that we were able to see these steps, um, and, and this would bring a global alignment, you know, uh, from the bottom. You know, think about Facebook. You know, it took them two three years to change the world. I'm not sure if we're going to be changing the world, but with the right tooling, you know, we we could do something. Then. This is not enough because, you know, what I like is, you know, what Irina said is, you know, from the top down is now we have the UNESCO, um, the UNESCO um, uh, recommendations, which hopefully, at least from the panel's founders, the, the, the policy uh, panel uh, that I was um, uh, moderating, it seems that, you know, these, these people, they wanted this, this kind of push from above because that's a mechanism I and mean, a means to go to their governments. And so, you know, if you have the bottom up and you have the top down, maybe, you know, we can go somewhere um, fast. That's, so I'm repeating, you know, I'm just putting yeah. context to whatever the other said. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you very much, Natalia. Um, Astrid, are you, are you able to speak now? No, you're, we can't hear you. Sorry, Astrid, something's wrong with your audio. And Vanessa is not here. No, Vanessa and Heather are not here. So okay. I'm going to add my two cents to all of this, which is um, I think more funder and government regulation around all of this would really help to advance things. I, I think we've seen that Plan S has been quite effective um, it's made a big splash and we'll see, you know, uh, in the coming years, whether that that um, attention will result in um, action, which I think it will. And if we could align policymakers around very, very bold regulation to require authors rights retention, immediate authors rights retention of, of articles, for example, to me would be another additional thing that would um, move move and uh, move open science along much more quickly than it it's going right now um so i'm gonna give astrid one last chance yes there she is we hear yeah, you. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that uh, i didn't want to be the last one but i, I had given uh, your question a, a thought yesterday evening when when i saw it so um, from the point of view of, of research libraries, um, very, very difficult to make a ranking of, of all developments that are needed to advance open science. Um, I can choose from a lot of developments, developments that are important, but thinking about it and, and having the input from uh, the Libre Open Science Roadmap that was published already in 2018, but is still very accurate. But also um, from a couple of workshops um, we, we did last year together with OCLC and with Scientific Knowledge Services, which was all about research, research libraries and, and open science or and the EOS. Uh, many topics are, are important for research libraries. I, I'm, I'm not going to name all of them, but I think the one thing that was mentioned all the time is that a cultural change is, is needed. Um, a cult and that's a topic that, that um, uh, research libraries are much focused on because of long standing attitudes that prevent the adoption of open science, um, risk avoidance by librarians, the lack of responsiveness by senior researchers. So for, for research libraries, I think the, the cultural change is, is um, the most important development to, to advance open science. Thank you so much. Yes, so we have investing in bibliodiversity, new research evaluation criteria, 
moving away from subscriptions, regulation around uh, funder requirements and cultural change. And I, I think with all of those suggestions, that's probably all of the things that we really need to move forward. So um, I wanna thank you all again so much for your participation. Um, uh, thank you for the or from the organizing organizations, but especially thank you to all of those people who participated in the sessions and the workshops. It was an amazing conference. And of course, we all know it was um, in parallel with several other conferences. So we really appreciate you taking your time to taking your time to spend time here at the Open Science Fair. Um, I'd also like to thank um, especially Natalia Manola and her team who um, have done an amazing job. And um, I know um, uh, probably up uh, at night occasionally and working on the weekends to make this whole thing a success. And um, Irina Kuchma as well, I know you are really involved and in um, you know, spending a lot of time and effort to, to get the workshops organized. Um, Natalia, I'd just like to hand it over to you. Um, if we were together in person, we would be giving you flowers, but I just, <laughs> I, I'd like to hand it over to you just to say a final thank you. And maybe you could mention the name of some of your team members who were particularly um, okay. a large co contribution. Okay, so thank you, Kathleen. So first of all, uh, you know, let's let's say let's 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 um, uh, focus on something that we uh, did. We said in the beginning is that this was you know led by Open Air, but it was a co-organization, co-organizing of, of many open uh, open science initiatives. And I think this is what we need to do in the future. Uh, you know, you know, join forces, you know, uh, and 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 do you know perhaps different kind of uh, conferences or workshops uh, targeting different people because perhaps, you know, I'm not sure how we can have everyone together in so many days, but the future is here for us to take and grab. And, you know, uh, if we show the way for a global, for a global alignment, you know, perhaps others will follow. So thank you all for, for participating in this. Uh, now, uh, let me see how I do not forget people, uh, you know, names of the people. So let me start with Paula, uh, uh, ah, last names, uh, from, from Mino, and uh, Ilaria from Getigan. Uh, how can I, you know, how can I do that? Uh, Pedro uh, from Mino, Athena from Liber, uh, just, just saying the, the, the first names. Anastasia from uh, from um, from uh, uh, Open Air, Vasilis, who are who is our designer, uh, Eleni Tolly and Electra from Athena uh, Research Center, who were uh, keen in, uh, in 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 uh, in in helping out with the logistics, uh, but also with the reviewing. Um, let me see who, who do I forget. So the, the people from the communication teams from all the organizing uh, uh, members. Uh, and then, um, uh, Irina, who, who am I forgetting? Athena, who has hosted all the sessions. Yeah, Athena, I said Athena, yeah, I mean, you know, she's great. Uh, uh, and uh, I think, you know, I've, I've mentioned most of, most of everyone. And, you know, what I would like to, you know, to end is, you know, if, if you put the previous picture, Kathleen, uh, you know, the, 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 the organizing, you no, know, the one before, you can see that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a woman power, you know, pull out Lautaro, <laughs> it's, it's there. <laughs> so this is something that, you know, next time we need to, to have more gender balance. <laughs> this is something that we have to look at. <laughs> I am great. I am great in this way. I, I, I know, I know. <laughs> I can escape yeah. this way. <laughs> okay, but this, you know, actually struck me. So, so first of all, it's women power, which is really great. And then, you know, Lautaro, you know, next year we're going to have more, uh, more, uh, more uh, men. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Natalia. And with that, yeah. I close the, the Open Science Fair 2021. And we hope to all see you in person somewhere in person. at the next event. Yes. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.